Hello and welcome everybody to this episode of the Hired Geek Podcast, episode number 105, the return of Josie Alquist. Uh, she's been away from the show for uh, quite some time, but this year we've kind of just uh, gotten back with some of our favorite guests uh, from previous episodes. So we'll link out to that previous episode in the show notes, also link out to Josie's podcast uh, and also uh, her new book that just came out. So uh, it was really great to catch up with her and learn more about the book writing process that uh, was long going for her, but so excited for her to have this book finally out. And uh, we talked a lot about digital community building, digital engagement and leadership uh, for higher education, which is the focus of the book. So uh, great stuff to kind of get you started uh, as you uh, continue to engage with uh, her work and her book. Uh, she's just a she's a great follow on social media and just a, such a great resource uh, of information on this topic. So really appreciate her taking the time out. And uh, again, another reminder, we've got our merch store live and running. Uh, definitely go check that out. Uh, and throughout the rest of this year, uh, you know, it's hosted through T Public. They always have great sales going on. So uh, keep an eye on that uh, and really appreciate uh, everyone's support there. Um, it's a great way to keep the uh, lights on for the show here. So after these brief messages from our sponsors, this is episode number 105 with Josie Alquist. This episode is sponsored by Degree.me, a one-stop college research tool for students. If you work for a college or university, you'll want to learn all about their ability to connect you with the right students at a budget-friendly price. To find out more, please visit Degree.me slash H-E-G. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Podcorn. Podcorn is a marketplace connecting podcasters to amazing podcast sponsorship opportunities, such as host-read ads, interview segments, topical discussions, and more. Podcasters of all sizes can browse and choose opportunities right on the platform, set their own rates, and collaborate with brands directly. I've been using the platform myself recently, and I love how easy it is to use and how they're helping bridge the gaps to give podcasters full control of how and when we monetize. Click on the link in my show notes or simply go to podcorn.com to sign up and start browsing sponsorship opportunities. That's P-O-D-C-O-R-N.com. Now, on to the show. It's good to have you back on the podcast, Josie. You're one of my, uh, I feel like this season I've had uh, several return guests, which I'm very excited to have them back on, hear what's been going on since uh, we had them last on the show and um, talk about everything that you have going on now. But um, so we'll, you know, we'll link out to that previous episode. So if people want to um, hear that, that was from February of 2018. So it's been over two and a half years uh, since you've been on the show last. So um, we'll start there of just introducing yourself, uh, who you are, and just kind of like contextually, like what's been going on for you since the last time that you were on the show uh, back then. Well, thanks for the invitation back, Justin. Um, I currently have a whole lot of landscaping going on outside my window. So <laughs> I, uh, I, mean, I feel like that's so typical fashion, right? You sit down to record mm-hmm, and then mm-hmm. they immediately turn like the blowers on or <laughs> whatever. So yep, of course. it's ironic. Um, so I'm out here in Los Angeles and last month I released – a book that I am positive when we were recording, I'm sure I was still working on and drafting through because <laughs> books take years and years to <laughs> to finish. Um, I also just wrapped up on my podcast season at Josie and the Podcast. So it's interesting. A lot of things are kind of coming to a like chapter end as we talk about um, books, which uh, is also kind of like interesting timing with the fall, not acknowledging the pandemic at all. But (laughs) like, so yeah, I mean, the difference is, I guess I have like a couple more nieces now. Um, My office, it's so funny, right before we went into quarantine, I had just finally finished setting up my office. Like I'd been in here for years, but you know, like when something just doesn't feel right, like you Mm -hmm. keep switching things around and I'd finally got it set. Um, And then because I'm here a lot now, I've always had a home office, but I, would you know, like I would leave to go speak or consult, like leaving my home to go work. And um, I've been thankful that (laughs) the home office is, is settled. Yeah, yeah, like well timed because I know um, a previous episode or you know an earlier episode of the podcast um, with uh, Matt Unger from Room Pact, he was saying that it was like it completely outside of anything that was going on. They were already planning. I just like, yeah, I don't think we need an office anymore for our small team, so we're just going to go all remote. And that like 
went into effect in like February and then like weeks after oh, like wow. spaces obviously were like closing down and everything. So um, it's just kind of funny if, yeah, you were kind of like, yeah, I got to finish this home office. Huh? And then like, like soon thereafter, it's like, well, good thing I did it now. You know, like I don't have to like, cause I think so many people were like, oh, I don't even have any of like the hardware, you know, like a laptop stand and oh, a gosh. camera and mic and all right. this stuff. So like everything was all sold out. So it's like, um, you know, for the few folks that like, we're just like, oh yeah, let me like gather stuff over time slowly and like, yeah. you know, outfit this whole space. So yeah, um, I got a lot cool. of questions about that of tools and chairs and yeah, you don't realize like sitting so long when you don't have like a really comfortable chair or the desk set up. So yes, I was grateful for that. What I wasn't grateful for, for the timing though, is I pretty much put myself in quarantine in the month of February in order to finish the very final major edits of the book, mm-hmm. um, which I did. I turned it in like March 2nd or whatever. And then I had two weeks of freedom and then back <laughs> back home um so it's like hmm, i maybe should have switched those months around maybe <laughs> right if you're like gone back in time i'm just like can I, can I just like go back and like push a deadline a little bit yeah. so just like hang out for a while and then like okay everything's like i can't be doing anything else anyway so let me just finish the book um yeah. well, but uh yeah i guess that, that segues well because that's obviously a big thing that you've been working on since the last time that you're on the show because yeah you continue to, to speak and you know be uh really prominent out on social media doing a lot of uh, work and, um, you know, sharing a lot of great resources. But one of them that's been a long time coming is the book. So if you just want to talk briefly uh, about kind of the inception of the book and the development of it, um, because it's, you know, any book, yeah, like you said, takes a lot of work, uh, it takes a lot of time and, you know, went through a lot of revisions and those sort of things. So if you just want to talk about um, that experience briefly of just sort of how the, you know, idea is like, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this, I'm going to write the book, and then bringing us to now that it is now released, it's now available for people to go get. So um, just really quickly give the, I guess, kind of the Cliff Notes version of that story of just how it came to be. Yeah, this will not be an infomercial, I promise, listeners. Don't <laughs> feel like. <laughs> yeah, I'm just so, curious because I feel like yeah, book writing is such a like totally. unique experience. So yeah, I'm oh, curious to wow. hear about it. Yeah, I could write a book about my experience <laughs> writing a book. Yeah. There was a moment in time where I was like, maybe I should start my own publishing company just from like, these are things that I would do much differently, uh, but those are not my strengths. So just, you know. Just because you could do something doesn't mean that you should. Mm-hmm. So the book is called Higher um, Digital Leadership in Higher Education, Purposeful Social Media in a Connected World. And I started formally in the book process the spring of 2016. Um, and that was through kind of the mentorship and nudging of – you know, some mentors um, to say, hey, you could totally submit an idea to a publisher based on the work that you do. And even that process took a lot longer than I thought to put together what that pitch would be and the evolution of that. And so it was almost another six to eight months then until I the contract was set in stone and then I actually started writing. And again, one of the lessons of writing the book, and honestly, maybe it's just like a life lesson period for me to like come to terms with is things take so much longer than you think it would. I think Mm -hmm. especially when I started writing, I'm like, oh yeah, I'll send this. And I think it was like in April. Um, Oh, I'll, I'll submit this by the end of the summer. Like no problem. And I mean, life happens or just... I I can write, but I am also not like Stephen King, okay? Or like whatever, right, like right. Br- Brene Brown. Or, I mean, they also probably have teams around them to help them, um, you know, get all the books out that they do. But um, my journey took a lot longer and I had to give myself a lot of grace and patience through that. And um, so again, like the book process, we can talk way more about that and lessons learned. But the actual inception of the idea started when I, in 2014, started to do research on how campus leaders were and were not using social media to connect, especially with students. Because I saw a really interesting group of vice presidents 
able to navigate and show up on a platform like Twitter, which felt very authentic and approachable to me. And I also saw students really reacting in replies to them from their activity. But I also knew probably four times or 12 times the amount of vice presidents out there that also were not doing that, that were running in the other direction <laughs> of social mm-hmm. media. And that can still happen today. And and that was around the same time I was in my doctorate. And, you know, you're learning research skills and, um, and, 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 and ways to think about questions and methodologies to answer questions that we don't know. And so I wondered, well, what is the difference? What are those leaders doing? What is it about them and the practices they're doing that I could help use as a framework to teach others? And so there was like a beta study that I did that then eventually informed and led to the book, which also includes two other um pieces of research that I did. One of them was with Brian Burke. And we wanted to look at Beyond just like a vice president, we wanted to survey the technology and social media use of all kinds of professionals in higher ed, from a grad student to, you know, mid-level faculty and so on. Um, And so I really wanted to be informed by some some good old data, (laughs) not just thoughts to fill the book with, that definitely informed what then resulted from it. Um, And what was also cool, it wasn't just the, the research, but almost the entire process and my own observations, what was happening in the period of time I was writing the book that helped inform what the framework turned out to be uh, a really a process of uh, like pulling on lots of other colleagues to get their reactions to it. That wasn't just done in isolation. So it felt like people could really see themselves in the framework that's, um, that's present in the book. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, cause that's what I think is, you know, a distinguisher for you. I, I like, I know you come at it with this, you know, that kind of research lens, like a very, um, you know, thoughtful and intentional, because I think there is, you know, people who are out there that would just kind of be, yeah, kind of like shooting from the hip of just like, well, this is what you got to do. You got to do this and this. And it's like, well, why though? Like, like what reasoning or kind of like evidence might you have for those things? You know, they might be effective practices, but I think it, I'm sure for a a lot of people, like you were saying, you know, people who are especially, you know, wanting to be digital leaders who are higher up in a uh, higher institution organization or anything like that, they might want to just know like, okay, what, what's kind of some, some data that's going to back up, uh, any sort of advice or guidance that is given and stuff like that. Um, which makes me think, cause like in terms of like the development of the book, you know, this kind of gets to be, I guess both kind of a just general book writing sort of question, but also certainly contextual to your experience. Like, cause I was like thinking of like, man, if you, you know, you'd want it to be maybe balanced between really relevant things about like right now in social media, almost being specific of like, okay, with a Facebook group, you should do this thing. Exactly. Mm. But it's like, they're, they're changing all the time. So it's like, well, maybe we should go on the other side of like, just kind of general values based kind of things that you should try to like internalize when you're navigating any platform. So like, you know, that would be the idea for any book. It's like, do you want to make it just like so granular and like relevant to the current moment? But then it almost kind of like has an expiration date. But on the other side, it's just kind of like timeless. <laughs> yeah. Some people could be like, well, it's, it's too general. It doesn't feel like applicable. It's like, how did you yeah. navigate that? I guess just generally with your book of wanting it to be both kind of like immediately relevant, but kind of also right. timeless. Well, this was also me in July, even trying to like sneak in last (laughs) minute, like, oh gosh, we have to change this thing because I, you know, like the way I talk about TikTok or some of it is just coming Mm -hmm. to peace with how technology, like we don't have control over it, including when you write about it. But you're right. I, I did try to dance between making it super practical and tactical, but even heavier on the philosophy behind it, um, because that is what's going to be sustainable, not only for it to be in print, but I think for us to view digital leadership at, in our practices. Um, it can't just be putting all of our time and attention into a platform because we know that's going to change. What is it about our own values and our purpose for the people that we serve that is going to ground our choices in how we choose to show up 
whether online, whether if that's in an email newsletter or on Twitter. So you're going to get like a little bit of education of the history of platforms so you can see it in a, in that context because – I mean, sometimes we just forget like, holy cow, Facebook has been around a very, very long time in our uh-huh. industry and we finally maybe figured it out. <laughs> um, ver- and, and then you could even look at Instagram like yeah, we don't see a lot of campus leaders um, and sometimes even departments like using that in a way that really speaks to that platform and the people that use it. And I, the lens is also one that centers community, like centers relationships at the heart of it. It's not a marketing book, even though that is a very big um, goal for a lot of institutions and for leaders. We have so much information and communication that we need to get out there, which I think you can do, but with social through the lens of digital leadership, you got to first put the like relationships community building at the center of your approach well yeah it actually makes me think of another thing in terms of yeah kind of it speaks to sort of the relevance and it being kind of sort of adaptable or you know kind of applicable to anybody is is i think sort of maybe and maybe confirm me (laughs) absolutely call me out if i'm like wrong here but like because i feel like you've kind of pivoted because i know like you're big on i think like social media like you know, just explicitly that word choice, because kind of like words mattering. I think like just if you've kind of intentionally maybe even pivoted towards like that idea of like digital leadership, like digital community building, because like you you hit right on it, like is what sort of like made it start to kind of swirl in my mind again is like, yeah, everything from an email to Twitter to, you know, if you like have a Slack instance for your camp, like there's so many ways that you can, you know, it could be all of them, you know, some of them or whatever, like uh, there's ways to make sure that you're really, thoughtfully building out digital communities for, you know, both your on-campus, online students, commuters, all these sort of things. So it's like social media is a part of that. Like it just, it is like a more higher level, more comprehensive, I guess, like viewpoint. Like, have you felt like that's more kind of the angle that you're trying to hit on? It's kind of like that digital leadership, digital community building versus just like, oh, it's just social media or something like that. I kind of see social media as a uh, an icebreaker into mm-hmm. technologies because um, we we can find commonalities. Not to say everyone is on social media, but it allows us then to have more purposeful conversations about bigger tech. Or um, so so that's always it's kind of been like my my again like icebreaker into this bigger conversation of just like humanizing how we use and approach technology from your online course to how you write an email. Um, and so it's kind of, again, that kind of that starter angle. And I do very intentionally use the word leadership as a leadership educator in digital context. And part of that is because of how much Sometimes when I get resistance to things, I feel like I might be onto something because I know something deeper is going on that we might want to sit and unpack. Um, Like some leaders have told me, I don't think leadership happens online. Like that, that is, so then what is it that's happening? Why are you going (laughs) onto these tools? Like if you don't want to make a impact and that's a definitely a, ethos of the book is that not only around ethics, but your values and who you are. Like if you're making, or if you could even look at it as like how you spend your time and campus leaders are so strapped for time. Let's look at it at an ROI perspective then. If you don't think you can lead using these tools, then like what, what, what are you on there for? Because someone told you to be on Twitter Uh like shamed you to be there. Like, no, like that's not, that's not the right rationale whatsoever. Um, And I also get there's concerns about these tools and I have problems ethically with these tools, but what would we tell our students when we see issues in the world, like that we would be change makers, right? So who better to lead in these places to have both difficult conversations as well as moments of empowerment based on how you'd, you know, like use your Instagram feed. And again, it's not dismissing that these tools aren't problematic, but if we are making a choice to be on them, let's back it up with 
you know, some values and some, some purpose. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Cause yeah, I mean, it is just the interesting thing. Like it, yeah. Some people are kind of avoidant because they're like skeptical as to like, you know, the uh, benefit of um, any of these tools or platforms or just, you know, putting yourself out there and, Cause it, yeah, it just makes me think of a lot of things because, you know, I feel like maybe it's like, you know, you could kind of find an inroad of like, well, what's the outcome that you want to achieve through these, you know, through your social media outreach or any of these kind of things. And like, you know, because they might just be, you know, essentially just like putting out like press statements on their Twitter or something. And it's like, well, I mean, if you want to like share out what's going on, maybe you can like utilize videos on your social media or something, you know, and it's like, it's the same outcome. You're informing your community about what's going on and allowing for kind of a discourse there or something. And you don't just have to like, just dump a bunch of text or something, you know, for, mm -hmm. for a bunch of it or something. So, but then it, like, it makes me also think of, you know, if there's like the skepticism or, you know, uh, real leadership, like doesn't happen online where it's just like, having to kind of, yeah, like take a beat and show where it's like, hey, the real world impacts these digital spaces and the digital spaces impact, you know, the real world. Like there's just a symbiotic kind of cycle that's happening there and just, you know, giving maybe like some tangible uh, examples of that. But well, and I think we saw examples early on in the pandemic, as well as especially around when there was a lot of more movement and conversations around Black Lives Matter and mm -hmm. the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, where these you did see pockets of campus leaders being able to use their platforms to show up authentically with messages. And then this is like another study that needs to be done. But those that maybe just put out press announcements or statements that fell flat, there's an incongruence. Most likely if the community did not respond to that message on social. Maybe that was the only time the campus had ever said anything like that. Or their policies actually don't align with the message that they just put out about that. Um, I, I also like there are certain methods of communication that better evoke emotion that is, that's why I'm such a fan of videos, mm -hmm. um, to be able to actually see someone and hear their vocal inflections and, um, and emotions that are going to connect to somebody on the other side of the screen. Of course, we value in person and, and it's a huge difference what happens when you can handshake or give a hug to someone versus when you're trying to interpret that in digital spaces. Um, but I think that's where uh, some I, I could already tell like where some leaders had not seen that value or would realize that that interpretation would come across that way in a couple of those two moments um, this spring. But what I think is good is I'm seeing a lot more of them now realizing that, OK, I, I do need to show up on camera. I do need to um you know, like use a little bit more what I call like personalized and humanizing language uh -huh. um, that like, okay, you're not talking to robots here. You're talking to students and families and, and emotionally where they are right now. And that doesn't make you a weak leader or unprofessional or not like leader like that makes you a human. And I think this is something that I we're slowly seeing in higher ed, but I think globally in leadership is getting redefined of what what that looks like it it isn't this like boardroom three-piece suit like everything is you know bulleted out like that's not that's definitely not social media <laughs> mm -hmm. and that's definitely not that life there's a shirt that I got, which is funny because it was just like a swag shirt from a conference that I got last year um, for this this ed tech vendor. But it's such a good shirt because all it has on the front is just be human. And mm -hmm. like people are like, oh, my God, that's such a great shirt. And I'm like, I just got it for free from a conference. But it is an amazing shirt because it always gets comments because that's the idea is I think we're yeah in this space now where obviously technology pervades our life so much that you know, it does feel like, there, you know, and especially right now that there's, you know, um, you know, kind of a that digital divide between us that we don't have that kind of human touch. But I think it is absolutely, you know, like the stuff that you're kind of getting on your soapbox and advocating for is kind of like, you know, I, I always kind of use this terminology is like, how can you do, you know, 
high touch with like high tech, you know, where it's just like, okay, we can like, you know, contour towards any social media platform or, you know, do something through, you know, Reddit or our Slack or, you know, uh, do a Twitch stream or something, you know, like there's like all these things that they can all do their own things really well. And if you kind of uh, contour around them, you can have these really high touch experiences to connect with, you know, students and other stakeholders um, as like a leader and just like, you know, um, yeah, just come to it in the way that like, you know, uh, best suits it. And, you know, uh, just with, yeah, like your dress and just the way that you speak and just, you know, like all those kind of things where it just allows you to kind of be authentic and uh, open to people. And I I think that just, you know, definitely garners a deeper connection versus Mm -hmm. like, you know, oh, I'm doing a Twitch stream, but I'm in, yeah, like a three-piece suit and just reading off of like a prepared remarks and that sort of thing. And it's just like, that's not like what that platform is You're like we want something it that's, wrong no. right yeah like it's more fun and dynamic and really social but it, you know it's kind of it's kind of like a webinar format like it's just the person who's doing the stream and then a bunch of people just in the chat doing whatever but like that platform is well suited for you know if you wanted to kind of do like a, a live you know q a that's more social it's kind of almost like a reddit you know ask me anything but with video or something you know like you can just kind of use it that way but um yeah like it, you just got to be human and just um understand you know even as like the president of institution that there's value in you uh kind of opening yourself that way so there's five guiding principles of digital leadership that i found both from those that have really embraced and and engaged with these tools um and that is of change and change has been forced upon us right over the over COVID-19, we have had to put our platforms or our practices into digital and virtual spaces. But part of change is also your view of it. It's not just the act of having to do it, but the openness and the willingness to embrace it. Because you even saying, like I shared earlier, leadership can't happen online. I've also heard that same thing about we can't engage with students through student engagement is not possible in digital spaces. It's not going to be as good. You, you're already like, if you think about mindset, even and in psychology, you are already setting up your programs to fail because you're viewing them. And I get it. We, we can't, we don't have to be happy about like, this is hard and, right. and potentially way far out of comfort zones and skill sets. Cause that's the other thing with tech. We can get a little triggered when we feel like we don't have knowledge around it because in education we value knowledge and um, like we have some control issues too in mm-hmm. higher ed and a slower pace of change. And so all those things are coming at us at the same time that in before there could be some resistance where now again, we're kind of pressed into these platforms. And one resolution that I give folks, which is why like Dustin, your podcast is so great is that you don't have to be the expert. You don't have to know it all. You do have to have self-awareness and say, I need help. I need to bring people around me, whether if they're on my campus or not, to teach me, to give me feedback, um, because that is such a big gap in knowledge or even like how comfortable you are in that tool. So, and, and again, that can be hard for for some folks to um, to navigate through. Sets up nicely. I can, I mean, uh, next question I want to talk about is, is kind of the idea is that like my, my brain right now is really like, I don't know, just thinking about it because it, it, it's yet to kind of unfold and everything. But because like you said, a, a lot of these platforms, a lot of things that are happening right now uh, that campus leaders are uh, engaging with of like doing, you know, an involvement fair through Zoom or something else, whatever, like they're doing it. So like, well, we got to do this and this is the only way that we can do it. So here we are, you know, and they might be kind of going through these uh, endeavors kind of begrudgingly, I imagine, you know, like they're kind of just, again, they, they don't think that like a student engagement or the leadership is, you know, really possible here, but, you know, so they may be kind of eyeing, you know, kind of whatever they can get back to how they usually did things. But my hope is that so many of these things are so valuable for, you know, online students, commuter students, and, you know, you have like a speaker that comes and you uh, record it and it's available online or you're live streaming it and all, all these sort of things, you know, and again, some of them are just being done on a necessity now. What advice would you give to campus leaders like for any of these things, you know, they're making strides right now with digital community building, you know, to make sure that these things don't just go away when things quote unquote, get back to normal. Yeah. I put out a post right away um, at, 
in the spring with some concerns that I had that we were just replicating. We were trying to take that involvement fair or that career fair and just slap it online with the same, you know, like schedule and structure Mm -hmm. and, and hope and pray or, you know, or completely prepare in our minds that it probably isn't going to go well, where we are learning now both as consumers and learners and considering the tools that are available you have to approach these look at your outcomes and not the title and structure of what you did in the past like we all know now what it feels like to be on zoom for eight hours or even like two hours is like rough (laughs) Uh psychologically on a person and physically and so we have to have that empathetic lens as we continue to maybe situate ourselves in in certain scenarios campuses might be faced with and like you said Absolutely. What I my, what I do fear is that folks will do a complete zigzag back because that's our safe space and that's where like the values of the institution are. And then, you know, like we, we're just trying to like, it's almost like therapeutic to not even address what happened a year ago mm. or whatever that scenario is. And like you said, there are so many populations that I think that Unfortunately, we may have ignored or left out in programs. We could have had a more diverse array of speakers or curriculum because it could be delivered in a different modality. And I really do hope that we keep that that option open, especially um, you know, as we continue to like rebuild whenever that is. <laughs> and there, there is no like getting back to. It's not even calling it normal. Um, mm-hmm. Again, I think we need to continue to see this as a transformation and willing to embrace that. What lessons can we take that's going to better the people that actually want to do it? And that's where I also, and maybe when I realize, like maybe I'm not situated to work on a campus, is <laughs> it's just we. There are some again that have these views and feelings of change and wanting to feel comfortable in the way things were done, that that makes it then easier for them. But then that's not who you're serving. You're not serving yourself. We're here to serve students or parents or whoever that is. What are the methods that they need to get this experience or information, um, again, through an empathetic lens? And that is the same lens of digital leadership, that your people are at the heart of this and, and what their needs are. And not to say we shouldn't take care of our needs and advocate for ourselves as higher ed professionals whatsoever, but just making sure that's in the right place. Well, as we uh, wind down, I mean, we've, we've talked about a lot of really um important stuff when it comes to uh, the work that you're doing around digital leadership. So uh, I'm curious, you know, whether it is stuff that's relevant to that or just kind of maybe generally to higher ed or however you want to take this. But, you know, what are you kind of geeking out about right now? Maybe if it's also just like quarantine hobbies or just like, you know, content that you're reading, watching, listening to. Um, So anything there, I mean, just stuff that you're geeking out about, stuff that's grabbing your attention and hopefully some stuff that we could uh, share out in the show notes. So I am... I'm a, I'm a learner, right? Strengths Quest is like learner, top mm-hmm. and center, right? <laughs> That's why I teach. That's why I'm a speaker and facilitator. So I've been geeking out a little bit more of online pedagogy, but outside of a institution walls. So I've been starting to create my own curriculum that will live on online platforms that aren't at a campus that can Mm. be more open access. I mean, we realize sometimes we have, you know, like struggles with Blackboard or Canva or whatever, but, you know, they actually are way, way more robust than some of these other ones that you have to, you know, like pay for um, outside of a campus. And it just makes you have to be a lot more innovative and creative with what you can do with some of those, um, with some of those platforms in order to, you know, like create a course or whatever. Um, so that's one thing for work. I think the other, like, I realized right away, like, oh my gosh, I'm not reading. Like my Kindle is telling me like, where are you? Um, I, I've had to kind of just give myself some grace about maybe that learner drive of mine just looks a little bit differently um, and not to feel like bad about that either. Um 
but like I'm le- I'm learning more about my neighborhood because I'm taking more walks mm. and I'm finding more podcasts to listen to. Um, so I think it looks different maybe than it used to, but um, being open to that. Yeah, I mean, because I've gotten, um, which is like surprising because I think people have told me that of like, oh, you got to like, you know, check out audiobooks in general or, you know, this one in particular. Um, but it did take a uh, global pandemic for me to like get into audiobooks, but it's allowed mm-hmm. for me to uh, like read, you know, and I guess it's also like quote unquote read, it's being read to me, um, <laughs> but uh, like way more books than I normally would have. So it's almost, I guess for me, like almost like an inverse of like, you know, this, this space and time is allowed for me uh, to engage with more books. And uh, it's been some, some great ones that I've uh, been able to consume. Awesome. But yeah, I think that it, it is so much of just like, whatever you're doing now is enough kind of thing. Like just for yeah. anybody where it's just like, I'm reading as much as I can, or I'm watching as much as I can. And, or, you know, for me, like, I have like just a pile of video games that I need to get to. And I'm just like, oh, I should play more video. I'm like, <laughs> I'm playing enough with like a newborn and just the yeah, rest of the things I got to oh do in the world. Gosh, so for um, sure. yeah, it, so it's, like, it is just also like a silly thing to beat myself up about. It's like, you got to play more video games. What are you doing with your life or something? It's yeah. like, like, this is a fun hobby. Don't like torture yourself yeah. if you're not doing it enough. Well, that's why like yeah. some people were posting like, oh, you should be like teaching yourself a new language or write that book or whatever. I was like, stop that. That's not. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> which yeah, I mean that's I mean that's a, a whole other conversation in and of itself. But like yeah, just it's like digital shaming. You know, people. It's kind of like I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Because I guess it's very less of like people calling each other out directly. It's just like if you are just you know showboating almost. It's just mm. like you know putting your like perfect life out there on Instagram or wherever. <laughs> but because um, yeah, we'll just leave it there. Like whatever you're doing right now is enough. Is enough. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, and you know, we also love to end these episodes on an optimistic note. So I know obviously you're, you're, you know, you've got the book out and you're kind of promoting it and just, uh, seeing it get out into the world and people engaging with it. Um, so I'm sure that's part of it. So if you want to speak about that or just anything else that you are looking forward to right now, um, to wrap things up on an optimistic note. Well, there were some delays in the book, the printed book getting shipped um, because we celebrated back in, uh, well, back in last month in September, the Mm. book launch. Um, And so today, actually, folks started to like share pictures that their book had arrived. So that was really cool because I mean, I haven't gotten mine copy yet, so that's kind of (laughs) weird. But I'm like to see people with the book um, in their hands, that is that is really neat. But the other thing that I'm, you know, like optimistic of, and you were talking about your new uh, little one, is that the week before, at least out here in LA, that we went into lockdown, I, uh, my niece was born mm-hmm. in uh, Montana, and I have not gotten to meet her yet. So I am looking forward to figuring out how to make that happen in the next few months, um, spending hopefully some very safe and quality time with my family. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely something to look forward to. And I know that's been the case for a lot of people is just, uh, you know, kind of prolonged uh, kind of gaps of when they've been able to see family members. And I know, yeah, for us, like certain, you know, members of the extended family haven't gotten to uh, Mm. meet the baby yet. So it's like, yeah, definitely something to look forward to. And I think it it allows for us all to recognize like, wow, I want to go and I want to like be there and be present and just have it be, really quality time and like as much time as I can give, um, yeah. and that sort of thing. So absolutely something to look forward to. And, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll be excited to see photos, uh, <laughs> you'll probably post out on, uh, you know, Instagram and elsewhere. So, um, but yeah, I mean, thank you so much for jumping on the podcast again and sharing all that you did and congrats on the book finally coming out. And we'll have ways obviously to connect with you and uh, the work that you do and everything that you mentioned down the show notes as usual. But yeah, just again, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Dustin. This is great. Thanks for listening to this episode of the podcast. Make sure to rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode of the Higher Ed Geek Podcast.